Good evening. Welcome to the Barnard International Artist Series first Fall 2013 event. We're so delighted that you're here, and I hope you're as excited as I am for this conversation and reading with Sadie Smith. I'm Mariana Robertson, the series administrator for the Barnard International Artist Series and an English major in Barnard's class of 2015. First, I want to say thank you. Thank you to the incredible people working behind the scenes so that we could be here tonight. Thank you to those who spread the word about this event and to all of you who came. Thank you to Professor Hisham Matar, founder and director of the series, for everything. And thank you to Zadie Smith for being here. <laughs> Zadie Smith is an author who has the rare gift of being able to both create worlds in her fiction and fully engage in the world we live in in her nonfiction. When reading her novels, I find myself fully engulfed in the movements of people in their worlds. They are real and expansive beyond the confines of the pages. While I was reading On Beauty, I called every dog I met Murdoch. Her books are both fully located in their worlds and transcend these worlds. Place could not be more important, and yet her works transcend place. I've never lived in Wilston Green, except when I was reading NW. I've never been Zora Belzey, except when I was reading On Beauty. Reading her books is being let fully into the lives of others. Not always pleasant, but always an incredible privilege. I think this is both a testament to Zadie Smith's power as a novelist and the way in which her books engage with issues that are very real. But what makes Zadie Smith so remarkable to me is the way she takes this ability to engage into the world we live in. She has written pieces on subjects as seemingly, di seemingly diverse as Lunch with Jay-Z, Middlemarch, and Family Christmases. But what she does, and why I believe she is so perfectly suited for our series, is engage equally deeply and critically with each of these subjects, and in doing so, reveals their connection to the production of culture and identity. This is what the Barnard International Artist Series is all about. Finding the connections between cultures as a way of thinking and living globally. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hisham Matar and our guest, Zadie Smith. Thank you, Mariana, who's been working so hard as the uh, series administrator. Just wonderful, so thanks so much. And thanks to all of you for being here. Greetings to all. Before we start, I'm just going to uh, thank about 150 people. Uh, I'll try to do it very quickly. Um, but really, it, is, um, it takes so much, um, it turns out, it takes so much to put something like this together. So many people are involved, and of course I can't mention them all, but at least a few of them. Uh, first, I'd like to mention our media partners, Guernica Magazine, um, and thank them for supporting the series, particularly Joel Whitney, Michael Archer, and Lisa Lucas. And from here in Barnard, the uh, events management people, the people that um, basically make all this possible, that set the seats and arrange the room and manage it, uh, and make everything look so elegant and effortless. I thank them all, particularly Tiffany Dugan and Amanda Gates Elston. Uh, they're a joy, really, to work with. Um, also, the communications team who have been spreading the word and, um, and uh, promoting the event. I uh, thank them all, uh, particularly Patricia Kiem, Abigail Peshkin, Lindsay Stuffel, and David Hobson, who has designed all the posters and the postcards. Uh, so elegantly. Uh, and more broadly, for the series in general, I'd like to thank uh, Brett Silver, our uh, Vice President for Development, and Provost Linda Bell. But most of all, I'd like to thank um, Deborah Spar, our President, who in, back in 2011, she and I met for uh, breakfast one morning, and I said to her, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have a series where we bring artists from all over the world uh, to come and um, speak and show their work at Barnard uh, from all genres, you know, filmmakers, dancers, uh, writers, thinking, you know, she's going to say, yeah, it's a nice idea, but um, too complicated. But actually, from that moment on, she's been so supportive and enthusiastic about it, and it wouldn't have been possible, really, any of this without her support. 
One way to, do, to, uh, to think of the Barnard International Art Series is as a modest attempt to learn about the world through its artists. Artists have demonstrated throughout the ages a profound ability to express the tenor of their times when they don't wish to even. In fact, especially when they don't wish to, I think. Ultimately, the series is a response to my students' curiosity, their enthusiasm to learn about what people living in faraway countries are thinking about, caring about, worried about. It's a sincere and passionate curiosity, I believe, and one to build on and encourage. However, although the students are the inspiration behind this forum, the Barnard International Artist Series is open to any member of the public, and in fact, it's a hallmark of the series that every event is free and, and, and open to anyone who's interested. Last year, for the inaugural event, we brought the Chinese and Italian filmmakers Chu Ching and Andrea Cavazzuti, who came all the way from Beijing and showed their wonderful film, Five Plus Five, about a small um, group of avant-garde artists in Beijing and shared the stage here and spoke about that film. This year, we are, honoring, uh, we are honored to be hosting two internationally acclaimed authors, each concerned with different preoccupations, Zadie Smith with race and class in Britain and many other themes, and Nadim Aslam with the war on terror. Nadim Aslam's event is on Friday next week. It will take place at 6 p.m. in Barnard Hall, which is the main building. Full details are on postcards that were outside. You might have seen them. Maybe even you picked one up. Um, perhaps you didn't know this, but by turning up today, you have committed yourselves to coming to the Nadim Aslam event. Um, you're obliged. Consequences will be exacted on those who don't turn up. Um, but please, really, he's a wonderfully interesting author, and, um, and, and I encourage you to come. But let us turn to tonight's event. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Zadie Smith, a writer I admire and a friend. Um, please help me to give her a very warm welcome. Stump your feet, clap, do whatever you do. Hi, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. I'm, I'm going to read from a, a story, actually. Um, some of you may have read it. It was published in The New Yorker. It's called The Embassy of Cambodia. And I'm going to read the first half, so you don't really need to know anything. Um, I have no idea how long it takes to read, because I've never read it before, but I'm hoping about 15 minutes. But if it goes beyond, just somebody scream. Um, the, the thing about this story is that it's in chapters, um, and they're scored like a badminton match. So the first chapter is called Love... One. Love one. Who would expect the embassy of Cambodia? Nobody. Nobody could have expected it or be expecting it. It's a surprise to us all. The embassy of Cambodia. Next door to the embassy is a health center. On the other side, a row of private residences, most of them belonging to wealthy Arabs or so we, the people of Wilsdon, contend. They tend to have Corinthian pillars on either side of their front doors and, it's widely believed, swimming pools out the back. The embassy, by contrast, is not very grand. It's only a four or five bedroom, North London, suburban villa, built at some point in the 1930s, surrounded by a red brick wall about eight feet high. And back and forth, cresting this wall horizontally, flies a shuttlecock. They're playing badminton in the embassy of Cambodia. Pock, smash, pock, smash. The only real sign that the embassy is an embassy at all is the little brass plaque on the door which reads the embassy of Cambodia and the national flag of Cambodia. We assume that's what it is. What else could it be? Flying from the red tiled roof. Some say, Oh, but it has a high wall around it, and this is what signifies that it is not a private residence like the other houses on the street, but rather an embassy. The people who say so are foolish. 
Many of the private houses have high walls, quite as high as the Embassy of Cambodia, but they are not embassies. Love, too. On the 6th of August, Fatou walked past the embassy for the first time on her way to the swimming pool. It's a large pool, although not quite Olympic size. To swim a mile, you must complete 82 lengths, which in its very tedium often feels as much a mental exercise as a physical one. The water is kept unusually warm to please the majority of people who patronize the health center, the kind who come not so much to swim as to lounge poolside or rest their bodies in the sauna. Fatou has swum here five or six times now, and she's often the youngest person in the pool by several decades. Generally, the clientele are white or else South Asian or from the Middle East. But now and then, Fatou finds herself in the water with fellow Africans. When she spots these big men, paddling frantically like babies, struggling simply to stay afloat, she prides herself on her own abilities, having taught herself to swim several years earlier at the Carib Beach Resort in Accra. Not in the hotel pool. No employees were allowed in the pool. No, she learned by struggling through the rough gray sea on the other side of the resort walls, rising and sinking, rising and sinking on the dirty foam. No tourist ever stepped onto the beach. It was covered with trash, much less into the cold and treacherous sea, nor did any of the other chambermaids. Only some reckless teenage boys late at night and Fatou early in the morning. There's almost no way to compare swimming at Carib Beach and swimming in the health center, warm as it is, tranquil as a bath. And as Fatou passes the embassy of Cambodia on her way to the pool, over the high wall she sees a shuttlecock pass back and forth between two unseen players. The shuttlecock floats in a wide arc slowly rightwards and is smashed back. And this happens again and again. The first player always somehow able to retrieve the smash and transform it once more into a gentle floating arc. High above, the sun tries to force its way through a cloud ceiling, gray and filled with water. Pock smash, pock smash, love three. When the embassy of Cambodia first appeared in our midst a few years ago, some of us said, well, if we were poets, perhaps we could have written some sort of ode about this surprising appearance of the embassy. For embassies are usually to be found in the center of the city. This was the first one we had seen in the suburbs. But we are not really a poetic people. We are from Wilsdon. <laughs> Our minds tend towards the prosaic. I doubt there is a man or woman among us, for example, who, upon passing the embassy of Cambodia for the first time, did not immediately think genocide. <laughs> Love for pox smash, pox smash. This summer we watched the Olympics, becoming well attuned to grunting, and to the many other human sounds associated with effort and the triumph of the will. But the players in the garden of the embassy of Cambodia are silent. We can't say for sure that it is a garden. We have a limited view over the wall. It may well be a paved area reserved for badminton. The only sign that a game of badminton is underway at all is the motion of the shuttlecock itself, alternately being lobbed and smashed, lobbed and smashed, and always at the hour that Fatou passes on her way to the health center to swim, just after 10 in the morning on Mondays. It should be explained that it is Fatou's employers and not Fatou who are the true members of the health club. They have no idea she uses their guest passes in this way. Mr. and Mrs. Derowal and their three children, aged 17, 15, and 10, live on the same street as the embassy, but the road is almost a mile long with the embassy at one end and the Derowells at the other. Fatou's deception is possible only because on Mondays, Mr. Derowell drives to Eltham to visit his mini-market there, and Mrs. Derowell works the counter in the family's second mini-mart in Kensal Rise. In the slim drawer of a faux Louis XVI console in the entrance hall of the Derowell's primary residence, one can find a stockpile of guest passes. Nobody besides Fatou seems to remember that they are there. 
And since the 6th of August, the first occasion on which she noticed the badminton, Fatou has made a point of pausing by the bus stop opposite the embassy for five or ten minutes before she goes in to swim. Idle minutes she can hardly afford. Mrs. Darrowell returns to the house at lunchtime and yet seems unable to forego. Such is the strange, compelling aura of the embassy. Usually Fatou gains nothing from this waiting and observing, but on a few occasions she's seen people arrive at the embassy and watched as they are buzzed through the gate. Young, white people carrying rucksacks. Often they're scruffy and wearing sandals despite the cool weather. None of the visitors so far have been visibly Cambodian. These are young people, likely looking for visas. They're buzzed in and then pass through the gate, although Fatou would really have to stand on top of the bus stop to get a view of whoever it is that lets them in. What she can say with certainty is that these occasional arrivals have absolutely no effect on the badminton, which continues in its steady pattern, first gentle, then fast, first soft and high, then hard and low. Love, five. On the 20th of August, long after the Olympians had returned to their respective countries, Fatou noticed that a basketball hoop had appeared in the far corner of the garden, its net of synthetic white rope rising high enough to be seen over the wall. But no basketball was ever played, at least not when Fatou was passing. The following week it had been moved closer to Fatou's side of the wall. It must be a mobile hoop on casters. Fatou waited a week, two weeks, but still no basketball game replaced the badminton, which carried on as before. Love, six. Now, when I say that we're surprised by the appearance of the Embassy of Cambodia, I don't mean to suggest that the embassy is in any way unique in its peculiarity. In fact, this long, wide street is notable for a number of curious buildings, in the context of which the Embassy of Cambodia does not seem especially strange. There's a mansion called Gary Land, with something else in Arabic engraved below Gary Land, and both the English and the Arabic text are inlaid in pink and green marble pillars that bookend a gigantic fence far higher than the embassies, better suited to a fortress. Dramatic golden gates open automatically to let vehicles in and out. At any one time, Garyland has five to seven cars parked in its driveway. There's a house with a huge pink elephant on the doorstep, apparently made of mosaic tiles. There's a Catholic nunnery with a single red Ford Focus parked in front. There's a Sikh institute. There's a faux Tudor house with a pool that Mickey Rooney rented for a season while he was performing in the West End 15 summers ago. That house sits opposite a dingy retirement home where one sometimes sees distressed souls, barely covered by their dressing gowns, standing on their tiny balconies, staring into the tops of the chestnut trees. So, we are hardly strangers to curious buildings here in Wilsdon and Bronsbury. And yet, still we find the Embassy of Cambodia a little surprising. It's not the right sort of surprise, somehow. Love, seven. In a discarded Metro newspaper found on the floor of the Derawal kitchen, Fatu read with interest a story about a Sudanese slave living in a rich man's house in London. It was not the first time that Fatu had wondered if she herself was a slave, but this story, brief as it was, confirmed in her own mind that she was not. After all, it was her father and not a kidnapper who'd taken her from Ivory Coast to Ghana. And when they reached Accra, they'd both found employment in the same hotel. Two years later, when she was 18, it was her father again who'd organized her difficult passage to Libya and then on to Italy, a not insignificant financial sacrifice on his part. Also, Fatou could read English and speak a little Italian, and this girl in the paper could not read or speak anything except the language of her tribe. And nobody beat Fatou, although Miss Derowell had twice slapped her in the face, and the two older children spoke to her with no respect at all and thanked her for nothing. Sometimes she heard her name used as a term of abuse between them. You're as black as Fatou, or you're as stupid as Fatou. On the other hand, just like the girl in the newspaper, she had not seen her passport with her own eyes since she arrived at the Derowells and she had been told from the start that her wages were to be retained by the Derowells to pay for the food and water and heat she would require during her stay, as well as to cover the rent for the room she slept in. In the final analysis, however, Fatou was not confined to the house. She had her travel card, 
given to her by the Derowals, and was trusted to do the food shopping and other outside tasks for which she was given cash and told to return with change and receipts for everything. If she did not go out in the evenings, that was only because she had no money with which to go out and anyway knew very few people in London. Whereas the girl in the paper was not allowed to leave her employer's premises, not ever, she was a prisoner. On Sunday mornings, for example, Fatu regularly left the house to meet her church friend, Andrew Okonkwo, at the 98 bus stop and go with him to worship at the Sacred Heart of Jesus, just off the Kilburn High Road. Afterwards, Andrew always took her to a Tunisian cafe where they had coffee and cake, which Andrew, who worked as a night guard in the city, always paid for. And on Mondays, Fatu swam in very warm water and thankful for the semi-darkness in which the health club, for some reason, kept its clientele, as if the place were a nightclub or a midnight mass. The darkness helped disguise the fact that her swimming costume was in fact a sturdy black bra and a pair of plain black cotton knickers. No, on balance, she did not think she was a slave. Love ate. The woman exiting the embassy of Cambodia did not look especially like a new person or an old person, neither clearly of the city nor the country, and of course, it's a long time since this division meant anything in Cambodia. Nor did these terms mean anything to Fatou, who was curious only to catch her first sighting of a possible Cambodian anywhere near the embassy of Cambodia. She was particularly interested in the woman's clothes, which were precise and utilitarian a gray shirt tucked tightly into a pair of tan slacks, a blue Macintosh, a droopy rain hat, just as if she were a man or no different from a man. Her straight black hair was cut short. She had in her hands many bags from Sainsbury's. And this Fatou found a little mysterious. Where was she taking all that shopping? It also surprised her that the woman from the embassy of Cambodia should shop in the same Wilsdon branch of Sainsbury's where Fatou shopped for the Derowells. She had an idea that Oriental people had their own secret establishments and shopped there. She believed the Jews did too. She both admired and slightly resented this self-reliance, but had no doubt that it was a secret to holding great power as a people. For example, when the Chinese had come to Fatu's village to take over the mine, an abiding local, local mystery had been, what did they eat and where did they eat it? They certainly didn't buy food in the market or from the Lebanese traders along the main road. They made their own arrangements. Whether back home or here, the key to surviving as a people, in Fatou's opinion, was to make your own arrangements. But looking again at the bags the Cambodian woman carried, Fatou wondered whether they weren't in fact very old bags. Hadn't their design changed? And the more she looked at them, the more convinced she became that they contained not food but clothes or something else again. The outline of each bag being a little too rounded and smooth. Maybe she was simply taking out the rubbish. Fatou stood at the bus stop and watched until the Cambodian woman reached the corner, crossed and turned left towards the high road. Meanwhile, back at the embassy, the badminton continued to be played, though with a little more effort now because of a wayward wind. At one point, it seemed to Fatou that the next lob would blow southwards, sending the shuttlecock over the wall to land lightly in her own hands. Instead, the other player, with his vicious reliability, Fatu had long ago decided that both players were men. He caught the shuttlecock as it began to drift and sent it back to his opponent, another deathly downward smash. Love Nine. No doubt there are those who will be critical of the narrow, essentially local scope of Fatu's interest in the Cambodian woman from the Embassy of Cambodia, but we, the people of Wilsdon, have some sympathy with her attitude. The fact is, if we followed the history of every little country in this world, in its dramatic as well as its quiet times, we would have no space left in which to live our own lives or to apply ourselves to our necessary tasks, never mind indulge in occasional pleasures like swimming. Surely there's something to be said for drawing a circle around our attention and remaining within that circle. But how large should this circle be? Love 10. It was the Sunday after Fatou saw the Cambodian that she decided to put a version of this question to Andrew as they sat in the Tunisian cafe eating two large fingers of dough stuffed with cream and custard and topped with a strip of chocolate icing. Specifically, she began a conversation with Andrew about the Holocaust 
as Andrew was the only person she'd found in London with whom she could have these deep conversations, partly because he was patient and sympathetic to her, but also because he was an educated person, presently studying for a part-time business degree at the College of Northwest London. And with his student card, he had been given free 24-hour access to the internet. But more people died in Rwanda, Fatou argued, and nobody speaks about that, nobody. Yes, I think that's true, Andrew conceded, and put the first of four sugars in his coffee. I have to check, but yes, millions and millions. They hide the true numbers, but you can see them online. There's always a lot of hiding. It's the same all over. It's like this bureaucratic Nigerian government. They are the greatest at numerology, hiding figures, changing them to suit their purposes. I have a name for it. I call it demonology. Not numerology, demonology. Yes, but what I am saying is like this, Fatou pressed, wary of the conversations drifting back as it usually did to the financial corruption of the Nigerian government. <laughs> Are we born to suffer? Sometimes I think we were born to suffer more than all the rest. Andrew pushed his professorial glasses up his nose. But Fatou, you're forgetting the most important thing. Who cried most for Jesus, his mother? Who cries most for you, your father? It's very logical when you break it down. The Jews cried for the Jews. The Russians cried for the Russians. We cry for Africa because we are Africans. And even then, I'm sorry, Fatou. Andrew's chubby face creased up in a smile. If Nigeria plays Ivory Coast and we beat you into the ground, I'm laughing. I can't lie. I'm celebrating. Stomp, stomp. He did a little dance with his upper body, and Fatou tried, not for the first time, to imagine what he might be like as a husband, but could see her only herself as the wife, and Andrew as a teenage son of hers, bright and helpful to be sure, but a son all the same. Though in reality he was three years older than she. Surely it was wrong to find his baby fat and struggling moustache so off-putting. Here was a good man. She knew that he cared for her, was clean, and had given his life to Christ. Still, some part of her rebelled against him, some unholy part. Hush your mouth, she said, trying to sound more playful than disgusted, and was relieved when he stopped jiggling and laid both his hands on the table, his face suddenly quite solemn. Believe me, that's a natural law, Fatou, pure and simple. Only God cries for us all because we are all his children. It's very, very logical. You just have to think about it for a moment. Fatou sighed and spooned some coffee foam into her mouth. But I still think we have more pain. I've seen it myself. Chinese people have never been slaves. They're always protected from the worst. Andrew took off his glasses and rubbed them on the end of his shirt. Fatou could tell that he was preparing to lay knowledge upon her. <laughs> Fatou, think about it for a moment, please. What about Hiroshima? It was a name Fatou had heard before, but sometimes Andrew's superior knowledge made her nervous. She would find herself struggling to remember even the things she believed she already knew. The big wave, she began uncertainly. It was the wrong answer. He laughed mightily and shook his head at her. No, man. Big bomb. Biggest bomb in the world, made by the USA, of course. They killed five million people in one second. Can you imagine that? You think just because your eyes are like this, he tugged the skin at both temples. You're always protected? Think again. This bomb, even if it didn't blow you up, a week later it melted the skin off your bones. Fatou realized she'd heard this story before, or some version of it. But she felt the same vague impatience with it as she did with all accounts of suffering in the distant past. For what could be done about the suffering of the distant past? Okay, she said. Maybe all people have their hard times in the past of history. But I still say, here is a counterpoint, Andrew said, reaching out and gripping her shoulder. Let me ask you, Fatou, seriously, think about this. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I've thought a lot about this, and I want to pass it on to you, because I know you care about things seriously. Not like these people. He waved a hand at the assortment of cake eaters at other tables. <laughs> You're not like the other girls, I know, just thinking about the club and the hair. You're a person who thinks. I told you before, anything you want to know about, ask me. I'll look it up. I'll do the research. I have access. Then I bring it to you. 
You're a very good friend to me, Andrew. I know that. Listen, we are friends to each other. In this world, you need friends. But Fatou, listen to my question. It's a counterpoint to what you have been saying. Tell me, why would God choose us especially for suffering when we, above all others, praise his name? Africa is the fastest growing Christian continent. Just think about it for a minute. It doesn't even make sense. But it's not him, Fatou said quietly, looking over Andrew's shoulder to the rain beating on the window. It's the devil. I'll stop there. Thank you. Maybe you just carry on reading. <laughs> How did this come about? Um, I, when I'm writing, I, I think it's quite submerged with me. I, I do live near the embassy of Cambodia, in, well, my mother does, in Wilsdon. Uh, and so I saw it turn up about four or five years ago. And then maybe a year ago, I wrote the title. And I, in my mind, it was a very abstract story. Um, I guess I was thinking of those Kafka short stories, you know, so wonderful, mm. um, on a strange place or a strange zone. But I, it's not in my nature to write in that way. So in the end, it was just a title for a year. Nothing happened. Um, and then when I thought about that kind of uh, unified voice, the voice of a kind of an area, all speaking in one voice, a kind of chorus. And then really Fatu just popped up out of nowhere. And, and then it all came together. I think sometimes you just need in my case, somebody, a character who draws in lots of ideas you've been having in a submerged way mm. for a long time. Yeah. I wonder once the work is done, whether you have any sense of it, in the sense that, not, I don't mean it in the sense of, can you judge it, whether it's any good or, or but, um, but I mean more, do you know it? Do you feel you know it? With the novels, no. I mean, it's, it's constantly, if I'm asked to talk about the novels or I meet people who want to talk about them, I don't remember anything, I mean anything about them. And it's not a pretense, I don't remember the character names, I don't know the plots, I don't know what happened. So um, I, I, always, I realize when I'm talking to someone who, who likes them that I, I am in some way hurting their feelings because I don't know what they're talking about most of the time. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if that's true of all writers. I, to me it's just something that I do and then push away. Like now, now that I have children, I, you know, when you potty train them, it's very similar. You know, they do something and then they just want it out of their view. And I think that's my instinct. Once it's done, I don't want to look at it anymore. <laughs> I'm done with it completely. Yeah. I feel similarly. I feel a kind of disconnect with the book. Yeah. Not, not only, um, it's very bizarre because you're motivated in, your, in writing a novel by your curiosity towards these characters, through the theme, whatever the ideas are. Uh, but once it's done, logic would say, well, then you are really the authority on this book. Yeah, the opposite but I feel it's the opposite. <laughs> yeah. and even the object becomes strange looking yeah. at it. I think you're very alienated by it. And I listened to an interview yesterday, actually, when I was cleaning the house with Tom York, the Radiohead singer. Mm. And he's, I mean, he's, he's a real genius, Tom York. Mm. I mean, unbelievable natural talent and also artistic talent, like always willing to try and work against his tendency to melody, you know, he has a very natural melodic talent. Yeah. And he said when people come up to him and talk about the early songs, particularly the early Radiohead songs, or if he hears them on the radio, it is a genuine sense of, oh, that sounds nice. And then it takes a moment before realizing, oh, that's me. Yeah. That's yeah. me singing, or that was us. Yeah. Yeah. And that seemed to me completely f familiar, yeah. that sense of distance. But I wonder once, I mean, I, I can understand you not feeling um, yourself to be an expert on the novel once it's done. But do you feel this thing that I feel, which is that once the book is, is done, about a year later, I feel it almost its effect catches up with me like a tide. And, but not, I don't mean the book itself, knowing the book, but somehow the book defines new imaginative yeah. ideas, no? So it, in, in a sense, it's as if the book starts to write what what you're thinking is 
It's I think that's do. definitely true. It, it makes the next thing possible. Mm. You cover a certain area, you finish it in your own mind, it pushes you towards something else. Um, I definitely felt that with NW. It was such a struggle to write, but exactly as you say, about a year after I finished it, I realized that I was kind of finally in my own mind an adult, and I don't have to sit down every time I write with a sense of terror. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you yeah. can think, well, I, I do know what I'm doing to a certain extent, and I can... So I never used to take on work, because I'd be... T or I'd say... I wouldn't say yes to an a essay or a project unless I knew I could write some of it. So I'd say to mm. my agent, don't say yes, but... <clears throat> excuse me, I'll see if I can write it in these mm. next two weeks. And if I seem like I'm going to make a start, then we'll say yes. Because mm. the problem with writing, unlike... I used to play instruments, for example, is that you know with the instrument that you know, you know the instrument. Mm. There's sheet music and you know yeah. that you have some facility in that area. Mm. But writing, this, and I think it makes it so mysterious to a lot of people, there's nothing saying that the person on this stage is a better writer than the person in the audience. It always mm. depends on what you do that day on that page. It yeah. always seems to be an accident. Yeah. You don't have a set of tools that are, that are set. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I write so awfully, and sometimes... <clears throat> well, but you, you don't know which person's going to turn up yeah. to, to do the writing. Yeah. Do you feel that um, now that you are, you have completed four novels, that the novels themselves start to do that thing that, I think David McLouf speaks about this, as a, that his books eventually, it's as if they are carving a groove, and he can't really, after... After yeah. a certain number of yeah. books, you can't really leave that group. Yeah. You could only drive deeper or yeah. keep going in the same direction. Do you feel that now? I do feel it. I think it's just an echo of what everybody feels in their lives, that once you get towards 40, those things you said you were going to do, you were going to go and spend a year in Istanbul, you, the reality starts to hit you that you are not going to spend a year in Istanbul um, without causing great chaos to your life. Um, so to me, it's like that... Um, and the thing which scares me about it, uh, there's a great quote, I think it's by Penelope Fitzgerald, which says that novels make you stupid in a certain way, but the po problem is they take so long to write. And while you're writing them, you tend not to be reading or engaging with the rest yeah. of the world. So to me, it's always a dead period. It sounds silly, but if I'm writing a novel for four years, or in the case of NW, seven years, I'm missing out on a lot because you're spending every single day doing this every day in the library, not mm. really reading the papers properly, not really engaging with mm. other books. When I come out, I feel it's great relief. Mm. I can do something intellectual again. Because yeah. novels aren't really that at all. They're not no, they're that. Not they might seem that to readers, no. but I, it's not an intellectual exercise, I don't think. No. And they're not about stories. No. <laughs> it's, a very, it's an odd practice, and I, yeah. I love this period in between books. I get nervous too, but I love the idea that I can go to my office and just read something about something that genuinely happened in the world. Um, it's, it's a very refreshing period of time. You're interested in rereading your, your work. I, I, I remembered how, how brilliant you are at evoking different sorts of voices. The work is populated with so many different voices, from white teeth all the way up to NW. And in fact, today, when you're reading from the Embassy of Cambodia, we could hear that. And it made me think, and I don't know if this is just the strangeness of how my mind works, so this might not make sense to anyone except myself, <laughs> but um, the, it made me think of this very interesting um, stage in uh, the history of, of Italian music in the 1500s when the human voice was um, employed not to, to sing about God or divine love or virtues, um, but to sing uh, about earthly matters, mm. to sing about human love and so on. So I, for a moment I thought, in a sense, what's going on here is a sort of secular gesture, yeah. these, these voices, and I wondered whether you think of it this way. Well, that happens ac across the arts now. There's a moment in the 1500s which is like the moment of individualization <laughs> across the board, that suddenly it matters not just what the son of a king is, but what Hamlet is in his own mm. particular voice, his own particular mm. way of speaking. We become aware of ourselves as as individuals, I was just actually writing about this a little bit in an essay, but it's got to be partly to do with, you know, if you live in a culture which absolutely believes in the idea of uh, an afterlife, um, it's certain, of it, but it's not even a question, it's a certainty of the culture, then individualization doesn't really matter because you're going on 
eternally, you know, there's nothing yes. being lost really. Yeah. But the moment that faith started to recede, who this person was on earth became spectacularly important. Right? Yeah. This very individual voice, this individualized person. Um, so that kind of explosion is, I think, where literature, literature we recognize instead of the, you know, uh, hymns or divine pieces of work or collective prose um, of like 13th, 14th century. It's where we begin to have this thing you recognize, the idea that somebody can transport this, what was once a sacred thing, this voice, onto paper, and it will be their mark, their sign. Yeah. Um, so to, to me, uh, I mean, I grew up uh, reading English literature right back. I mean, I had to study it from Chaucer onwards. And English literature is the story of the voice, no? Mm. Of different kinds of voices, of voices mm. competing with each other. Mm. Um, and it's all I uh, really ever was interested in, impersonation of various kinds. Did you feel that there was a um, reading before university uh, and reading in university, did it feel like one line or was there a, a, a different um, um, well, in England there is a difference. So there was yeah. in my generation in that I used to read for pleasure. Mm. <laughs> when I was a child I read a lot of, and it's really now having children that I remember how, for instance, how much fantasy I read, how much sci-fi, how much genre of all kinds, a lot of crime, a lot of Agatha Christie, for example, enormous amounts of Agatha Christie. And when I got to Cambridge, all of that, including what we would now consider literature quite easily, people mm. like Graham Greene, yeah. John le Carre, was really verboten, you know, they were not oh. mentioned, they were not on the, on the syllabus in any form. Um, the syllabus ended around 1950. You, I remember asking to write about Nabokov for a, for a paper, and yeah. I was told, no, 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 we don't do that. <laughs> I'm sure that's changed now, of course, but uh, it was the tail end of, the, of that idea of the canon of being absolutely uh, straight. You could take modules in American writing, I think perhaps a module in post-colonial writing, um, but it was, it was very strict and straight, um, which, di I mean, it did me an enormous amount of good. I, uh, being forced to read things like Clarissa, which you probably read for fun on a Tuesday, but for me... <laughs> All the time. <laughs> it had to be pinned down, you know, it's like 1,500 pages, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, it's those reading experiences that you'll never have again, and to read them in a group with such intelligent people it was wonderful, but yeah. I think when I got out from under college, I really needed to uh, work out what it was I liked rather than what the mm. Cambridge syllabus likes. Mm. And also in your, in your non-fiction, you are interested in this subject of voice. I'm thinking of this wonderful essay that you wrote for the New York Review of Books, I think, speaking in tongues yeah. uh, about Barack Obama where you, you compare Barack Obama to, to um, Eliza Doolittle. Yeah. Uh, and, and you chart really your own history, uh, your own personal history of, your own personal history in tongues. And um, how when you first went to Cambridge, uh, you were speaking in these two different accents. Um, an accent that you grew up uh, with and the accent that you you wore in, mm -hmm. in Cambridge and that space between those two, I found that very interesting. And I remember there was a line in the essay where you say it was um, it was like living two lives. Yeah. Uh, I think I mean that that's how it is in England, even to more extreme extent in France. Know that yeah. if you come as a I always think of it in terms of guest and host. I guess I I structured N W along those lines. If you come as a guest into somebody's home or in this macro case as a guest into somebody's country, you can tell a lot about the country by the way it reacts to the appearance of the guest. Mm. And in France, um, more so than England, but it's a similar case, you're very welcome, you're very welcome as long as you're exactly the same as us. Yeah. That's the basic principle yeah. of French and English uh, assimilation or whatever they want to call it. Um, so uh, that can be agonizing and for a writer like Camus yeah. is a really good example now yeah. who was yeah. I always felt very close to Camus because I also mm. greatly appreciated my British education as Camus greatly appreciated his French education. But then when you know, he had these two parts of his life at war during the Algerian yes. war, he was yeah. really torn apart yeah. because to him he'd been made by this culture, it had made him everything he was, given him these, this philosophical training. Mm. Um, so I, I guess I, I had a little bit of that growing up, but gra def gratitude, um, but of course you don't want to be only in a state of gratitude to the state that you grew up in. That's yeah. not a, it's yeah. not a healthy relationship yeah. to have with the state. Yeah. 
difficult to think yeah. of uh, di difficult to think of a writer that has been more suspended in a sense between two cultures or two interpretations of culture as 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 Albert Camus. Um, which is also why I think of you because all of the subject it, it, it's it's why I think of you as a writer of distances, in a sense. You're a writer that is um, charting these distances between Wilson Green and Cambridge, between white and black, between America and Britain. Um, and you are very good, it seems, on some level. You're very good at, at um, entering these different, different, um, different um, states but it makes me think of how does that, um, what facility that gives you, you feel in the novel. Do you feel that that is a subject that, that, that you are interested in? I think, I mean, I always thought it, it came from my schooling. I went to a very big, what you would call a public school, um, very rowdy, pretty wild, you know, 2,000 kids from everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and those kids, I meet them all the time out in the world, they have something, I think, that, that private school kids rarely have, which is a real... They have to be so adaptable. First of all, you've got to deal with all the people in the school, half of whom, you know, traditionally, culturally despise you for one reason or another. It's a constant battle. And then you, you also have to go out in the streets and deal with all different kinds of people, deal with the teachers, and deal with your peers, the parents of your peers, go into different households all the time. Mm. You know, you might have a friendship group and find that one day you're going to what you would call the projects to see a friend and the next day you're going to a big house in Hampstead. So yes. it's that kind of mix. It means you have to really be adaptable in your brain. Whereas yeah. if you're only going to big houses in Hampstead, you, you only have to be one way. Um, so it, that's partly it. Um, I think what it can cause maybe at the extreme end is a certain kind of uh, uh, detachment. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad. I, I just have always had it. I don't know if there are other mixed race people in the room. I, th there might be a theory that, you know, if, if you look at one parent who's white and one who, parent who's black, it, the accidental nature of your birth, which of course is the same for everybody, but it's it's kind of dramatized in the way yeah. that's very uh, literal. Mm. So my my first thought always when I was a kid, mm. my parents were very leftist and always going on marches to free Nelson Mandela or whatever. You know, that was their whole lives. <laughs> that's what they did every day. Um, and I I was. Um, completely with them and I went on all those marches but I remember as a child always thinking but if I'd been born across the street would I have completely opposite views I always thought that mm. I always had a sense of detachment from from what I was in and I, I don't know I think it was partly to do with with having these odd odd couple as parents do you miss home do you miss England I do I mean but but it, I think it's the destiny of all English writers to feel that England is over and that they can never go back to it. <laughs> I'm just one of the 50 million English writers to feel that. Um, I love England, but, it, but England, the nature of it is that it's a very nostalgic country so, and the people are nostalgic, I am too, so it only takes one generation for each generation to feel, oh, it's all gone. Everything I loved <laughs> is gone and I can never go home. And it's the constant state. It makes me very English, I think, that feeling. That everything I loved is gone. I do feel that sometimes. <laughs> um, but uh, I do miss it. I miss London in particular. Um, but I, I think um, the thing which makes me quite anxious, like compared to you and so many other writers, I'm actually extremely untraveled with very little experience. You know, I was born on the same street. I lived there my entire life. I only left in the past decade. I've hardly been anywhere. So as a writer of distances, I really need to expand my repertoire of places. <laughs> Um, but at the same time, that's really exciting, the idea that I will one day go to China, I will see Japan, I will go to India for more than four days. I, I, I really, I feel like that there's a whole world that's going to open up for me, and as a writer, that's really important to feel there's somewhere to move. Yeah, yeah. And because I've literally done nothing and know nothing, I feel there's a lot of opportunity <laughs> in my 40s and 50s and 60s to, to grow as a, as a writer. Istanbul, then. For Istanbul, you. yeah. That's where I'm going. I got sentimental last night and missed London, and I, I started reading a book that a friend gave me yesterday, in fact, just by accident, um, by Natalia Ginsburg, you know, the Italian. Oh, yeah, Italian I'm obsessed with her. Yeah, yeah, those two essays about London. About London, yeah. yeah. They're amazing. Um, and she, 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 she spent some time in London in the early 60s, yeah. and um, 
was really taken by the sadness of the place. Yeah, she writes a piece about how bad English food is, which of mm. course is a very well covered subject. But um, <laughs> it's so wonderful. She just found it the most melancholic, depressing, awful country in the world. It's all, it's all written. I, I actually, I, I speak Italian not very well, but I use her stories to translate because it's very crystalline, yes. pure prose. Yeah. I really recommend her to everybody in the audience. She's stunning. Um, yeah, yeah, Natalia Ginsburg. She, she actually, she, uh, w one of the, the reasons she, uh, she comes, up for, the, comes up with why this country is so sad is that she says that they have this sort of peculiar intelligence that is um, only uh, in areas of governance and tolerance and organization. They're yeah. intelligent on that level, but that they're stupid on the street, she says. Yeah. There. And she says that Italy is the other way around. Yeah. Where Italy, the, on the <laughs> no governance, <laughs> the, best food. The yeah. street, there's this incredible intelligence that is useful for nothing, really. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> Uh, she says this, there's a sentence that I wrote down next, I wanted to read it to you. Um, Every place where the English gather to chat to one another exudes melancholy. Yeah. Uh, we don't know how to do that. We don't have any equivalent of the public square. That just doesn't exist in England, the idea that you would have mm. to gather in a place. It's too cold and miserable to gather anywhere with anyone. Um, but, uh, but no, she's very ad admiring of, of the organization of England. And it's also written about a lot, but I have to admit, when I was a child, it was something I really genuinely appreciated. Mm. There is something about England that, that r is extremely reasonable and, and runs well. If you're on the right side of it, you can mm. also be on the wrong side of England's yeah. lethal reasonability. Yeah. Um, but I, I did appreciate it. I, I think I came from a kind of chaotic background in some ways. and It was nice to know there was this, this state which would um, help you when you needed yes. help. Yeah. I teach a class here called um, Exile and Estrangement in Global Novels, and it's, it's really one of its main, one of the things it tries to do is to, to read novels as expressions of individual artists, but also as a sort of symptom of historical time. Um, and um, I suppose in some way it's, it's uh, inspired by that famous line by Rilke, O oh, ancient curse of poets complaining when you should express. And I was wondering whether you feel this um, burden to express and, and, whether, and, and whether if you feel that your novels are an expression of your person only or if they are also an expression of something wider. I th when I started, I didn't have a lot of time to think about it because I didn't have a very quiet career. You know, it just began in quite an explosive way and I just had to, suddenly that was my life and I just mm. had to be a writer. It was like an yeah. obligation that had suddenly landed on me quite young. Yes. And I just thought I'd better write since I've been asked to, or given the opportunity to write, I should carry on writing. Um, but now, it, it depends what it is. With the essays, I, f I feel really clearly that I don't have any uh, original ideas. It's not about having any amazing wisdom or it's just that I feel what everybody feels uh, but I have a small gift of being able to express it clearly. Mm. That's what I feel when I'm writing my essays. That I'm just saying exactly what everybody feels all the time. Mm. And all I'm trying to do is, is, is express it in a, in a clear way so that we can recognize ourselves in it and say, yes, that is how I feel. That's all I want to do when I'm writing essays. There are other mm. extraordinary essays who are actually, you know, idea generators who are having these extraordinary insights. I don't feel that that's what I do. I'm just trying to find a a way to allow us to express ourselves kind of together. Mm. So I think a lot of mm. things in the culture make things very unclear, deliberately muddy them or disguise things from you. Mm. And sometimes you just need simple things said clearly um, so you can act upon them in some way. So in the non-fiction, that, that's all my remit as far as I'm concerned. And then with the fiction, uh, well, I was I started writing a story today and, and I... I really, it always begins with an idea. It's a very simple idea about a, a, a minister. You know, you know when a natural disaster happens in various countries, often the aid doesn't come in, but certain people get out. Yeah. So I was just thinking about that journey, what happens to the minister of the interior as he packs up his hands, yeah. gets in the car and heads to the airport first before anybody else. So when I have an idea like that, it's a very simple idea. Um, what I notice is that I, I have a kind of 
generative imagination, so I try to write something short, and I think it's just going to be a short story. But the moment I get to the guy, then he has all this furniture, and then he has family, and then he has this, and it just kind of keeps going. Yeah. And, and as I get older, I'm really so thankful f for that, that mm -hmm. the people are always interested to me. I, mm -hmm. The ideas, like abstract ideas, are, are, are less so. I don't really start a novel with that plan. But if there's a person and, and I can get their voice or some detail of the way they're dressed, then it just kind of mm. moseys along. And, and it's lovely, that, that aspect of yeah. writing. Yeah. I have a question from, um, one of a, from a student. Yeah. Um, finally, for some real questions. <laughs> uh, Uladini Patricia Odeemi asks, in Changing My Mind, your collection of essays, you talked about this idea of an essence, a black womanness, that writers like Zora Neale Hurston made tangible. Does this essence make you feel like you are writing in some kind of tradition, or instill you with a sense of duty? Um, well, when I wrote that Zora essay, she had a much more complicated feeling about that. Um, she obviously was a black woman, and, and she wrote, um, for, I suppose, from that perspective. But she also she wrote a famous book called Seraph on the Swanee, in which everybody is white. Everybody. This is about 1935. It was an absolute scandal. Can you imagine? Mm. Well, her black audience so desperate for this book, such a rare thing from a black author, and she decides to write a book entirely about white people. But she, that was her expressing her, her freedom as a human being. She was a very perverse person, and she was determined to write whatever she wanted, whenever she wanted. It's, it's not her best book, I don't think, but it was an interesting gesture, you know? It's a kind of like a radical yeah. thing to do in, in, her, in the context she was in. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm very resistant to the idea that, that people or races have essences because that belief is, of course, the thing which also motivates uh, racism. Mm. If you believe there is an essence to the Jew, you're very quickly moving into this area in which you can pinpoint the essence, decide what it is, and then persecute people for that essence. Um, I believe in culture, I believe in the idea of Jewishness, that is your love of Jewishness, your interest in it, your decision to be a part of it, but I, I don't believe in a kind of eternal essence in, in any group of people, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And it is extremely, when I was writing that essay, I was trying to pinpoint my own wish to believe it, as in it's extremely tempting sometimes and very comforting to mm. feel that I am in some deep spiritual way a black woman connected to all these black women. I can claim their achievements, and, but it's not true. Mm. Zora wrote her books, I write my books. Mm. I love her, but that's the kind of um, mm. relationship I'm interested in between mm. individuals and between peoples. Mm. It has to be love, not just a claiming yeah. for the sake of yeah. the claim. Yeah. You are um, obviously very interested in culture, and you write about a very wide array of subjects. Um, and I was wondering whether you saw a distinction between your pen as an artist and your pen as a citizen. I've always been really wary of um, p p like activism, but just because I always thought I'd be terrible at it. Um, first of all, you have to be certain. That's the whole purpose of activism. You have to take a single issue, pursue it, and pursue it with your whole self, uncynically. Um, and y yesterday I was judging a documentary prize, which is about exactly that. It went to the act of killing. An unbelievably yeah. great movie. I mean, a spectacular yeah. movie. Um, and I admired all those people, and I saw how, how much I would be incapable of, of doing that kind of work. Um, but if you write about people and you write about culture, you find yourself uh, in the political realm one way or another, no? Mm. But, um, and people will always try and uh, ask you to, to lend whatever uh, abilities you have to a single voice, but it's just my personal opinion that the writer is there to needle and to diverse, make diverse and to complicate and to be probably quite annoying to activists one way or another. Yeah. But um, that's part of the task. Yes, and that's also what I meant by 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 being a citizen. In a sense, it's you know that is also. Part, I mean, in a sense that it's a you are. It sounds to me, listening to you, that you do see it as a as a um, 
not as a duty, but as a as sort of a, as a public service in a sense? I think, I mean, at the moment I'm being a very bad citizen because I'm part of the globally moving, non-local, whatever I am, writer, academic type person. That's not being a citizen just moving back and forth any way you like. It's, that's not really anything to do with citizenship. To me, to be a citizen is to be local, engaged mm. locally, and involved mm. with your community. Yeah. Um, mm. So that's really what I've, mm. I think I've got to get back to. But it's, you know, yeah. it's been a, a pleasure and a joy being moving in the way I yeah. have. But to, to me, citizenship is about local engagement, I think. Yeah. Another, student for, another question from a student. Um, this one is from uh, Nia Ashley. Could you speak to the idea that beauty and intelligence are still seen as mutually exclusive, especially when it comes to women? Um, I think this came out of, there was a piece, amazingly, a Republican an Italian friend sent it to me. It was like a little editorial where someone had got the energy up to write that, um, that I couldn't be a good writer because in this person's opinion, I was too beautiful to be a good writer. Um, and when you thought about women writers, if the good ones were always ugly, that was the point of this article. <laughs> Um, so, uh, <laughs> but, but what I thought about, what's really interesting about it, I remember uh, when my first book was published, and a lot of that was written, is what it reveals on the other side. Mm. It reveals that if a woman is beautiful, she needn't do anything else, right? Yeah. That's the purpose. Yeah. The woman's only real value is her beauty. Yeah. And the only women who try to do something are ones who don't have that essential thing, yeah. which, is, which a woman should have which is beauty, that's your cachet, that's what you spend in the world. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have it, if you're as ugly as George Eliot, the only thing you can do is become a genius, yeah. because there's no other way to be in the world. That's, yeah. that's the that's dark the principle. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, it's deeply misogynist and, and yeah. deeply um, uh, disturbing. And of course, the flip side of it is, I, I remember, uh, as I say, when my first book was published, I had friends from college and from roundabout who were also being published at the same time. And it was impossible to avoid noticing that if it's a young man, the assumption is of seriousness. No, you assume that young man yeah. is probably a genius. After all, he's a young man. And, it, and if he grows a beard, then he's certainly a genius. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. So there's always an assumption on that side. And a woman, who, she's just won a book prize, and she seems young, she, she can't be serious. It cannot be possible mm. that she is young and, you know, okay looking and, and can have any talent, because why would she bother? when you can just be part of this, whatever it's meant to be, sexual exchange, mm -hmm. where, where that's where your real worth is. Mm -hmm. um, so I always found it uh, pretty offensive because I, I knew what it meant, really. Mm -hmm. I remember, actually, the first time we met, I think, was in 2007. Yeah. It was in, um, in Florence for the Vallambrosa Prize. And, uh, and these, this photographer came to photograph us, and he pulled me to one side and was satisfied by one or two photographs. Yeah, then he took you <laughs> and he just wouldn't yeah. stop for you. And I think yeah. you, I remember you, you sort of waved and then I came and, and <laughs> got you away, pretended there was something incredibly urgent yeah. you needed to go to. It's but, so interesting, um, like now if I meet young female novelists, I can talk to them about it, but I remember so clearly in the mm. early days, if I had to do a piece of press, they'd phone through and say, oh, we're going to bring hair and makeup, it'll take about five hours. I said, well, if, if it was Ian McEwan, would it take about five hours? Would there be yeah. hair and makeup? Because if that's not the case, then don't bring the hair and makeup. Yeah. So it, it's fascinating that they just assume it's a young woman. She must yeah. want to be photographed for five hours. She must have nothing better to do yeah. than delight in yeah. trying on all your shoes. Yeah. But um, it's not, not the case. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, se several students um, wanted to ask, this is a, a, a version of, of, of several questions, really. Um, um, how did you manage, uh, no, sorry, um, yes, how did you manage to write your first novel, White Teeth, while you were a student at Cambridge? How did you balance? <laughs> I didn't write all of it there. I, I wrote, I started it there and I wrote, wrote a heart about half. I, um, I had my finals to do. I was really stressed. It just... I don't know the story, it was one of those things, it, was, mm. it just had its own power. It started, I have a half-sister who, much, much older than me, because my father had two families, and uh, she came to visit me in Cambridge, and I, I'd never asked her before, she was already, I guess I was 20 and she was 50, and I asked her if she knew anything about my parents' meeting, and then to my memory she said something about, well, well they, 
met at a party, your dad had come to pick me up, and your, mm. mum, your mum was there, who was also 20 at the time. Mm. Um, and it just stuck in my mind as such a ridiculous story, and so hilarious. And also the fact that they got married four weeks after meeting each other, which explained a lot, given, the, <laughs> given what happened afterwards. Um, so uh, it came from that, you know, and it became this kind of comic, uh, ridiculous version of something which is, in fact, in our lives, quite serious and quite sad, really wasn't a happy marriage but it became this kind of comic version um, mm. and once I started I really I really couldn't stop writing it, it just it just barreled along yeah it wasn't like work mm. wonderful well we'll take a few questions but I have to apologize in advance I know uh, uh, there's so many of you want to want to ask Zaidi questions but we we are limited for time so we could only take about three or four at the most so please keep your questions brief and, um, and, and no, uh, no need to, to, um, to comment. Um, just, just, uh, just ask <laughs> questions. Um, thank you. So um, questions, please. Microphone is there. Put your hand up and it will magically arrive. Hello? Oh, well, sorry. Um, I was wondering, what's your, do you do any research uh, when you kind of um, create your novels and you kind of look into um, the voice of your characters and their experiences, uh, especially if they kind of come from an immigrant background? Um, do, you, like, how, do you do any kind of research? And if so, what is that process like? I do the, the minimum. Like if, in, like in the Embassy of Cambodia, if I'm, if I'm going to, I don't know what kind of research would be appropriate. Like, if you're asking me if I'm going to write a Nigerian character, or for instance, that there's a Pakistani family in the book, am I meant to go and live with a Pakistani family for six months, or, but what, you know, what is the research that would be involved? I don't know. I, I have to go with my gut. I maybe do a minimal amount of thinking of my Pakistani friends, what their names are, what would be likely. <laughs> I steal a lot of names from friends, but I know a lot of different types of people, which makes it a little easier. Um, and then, for instance, in Fatu's case, I needed to know for sure how someone would get from the Ivory Coast to London. So that's a little bit of research, what would be a likely journey. Um, but what's concerning me more is always like an emotional reality. I can't really, and, and for that, you really just have to kind of check it inside yourself. Yeah. And, and do something perhaps like actors do. I think most writers of, I guess, what I do is basically realist fiction. They have a bit of an actor in them, though. The same thing that actors do, writers do. It, it, mm. You have to take yourself, find some bit of yourself which feels like a 22-year-old girl who's basically a slave in a house in London and see if you can thread that out and, and make it work. Mm. Hello. Um. Hi, uh, I was wondering, uh, it's a widely held belief that uh, the first novel a writer uh, tries to write is invariably autobiographical. And uh, so a lot of uh, young writers, I think, uh, deal with that. So I was wondering whether you were aware of that when you were writing your first novel and how you dealt with that awareness. Um, it was autobiographical, but the only way to put it is the way my mind works I was a minor character in my autobiography, if you see what I mean. It was really about everybody else. Um, so it was more about, the, I guess, the milieu I lived in, but it was also uh, really the regurgitation, because of the kind of writer I am, of three years of study. You know, what White Teeth is, in my view, is a lot of other people's books, you know? A lot of other English books, really, all squished together into this new book. Books are always like that, in, in my view. It's, it's always uh, a process of reading, but in my case, it had been a very intense process of reading and then straight into the writing. So there is a lot of, even in the epigraphs, there's so many uh, different writers mentioned and so many references. So it was autobiographical in that sense that it was the product of my reading. And then there was, you know, this kind of cartoon version of my family, I guess. Hi. So you wrote that great essay about Facebook, and it got me thinking about 
all of these things that we have in our lives as young people consuming culture. So we have Spotify that shows us all the music that we like, and like we can curate our tastes so easily, like the algorithm is presented to us. And you experienced, it sounds like kind of a discomfort, having to deal with the canon just being presented to you and not being able to pursue what automatically you would like. So I guess my question is, do you worry about us in that sense? Um, you know, I, I'm really, uh, the canon wars, the weird thing about the college I was at Cambridge is that we were doing all the French theory canon wars at the same time as having to read the canon. So I had both um, simultaneously. I, I would, that experience, honestly, if I was making a degree uh, for young people, I would do it very similarly. I, I think it, sometimes it's important to take in what you don't immediately find easy or likable. It's just, it's useful in ways that it's hard to make a pleasure-based argument for. But, um, but not everything in life is pleasure. Um, but, but actually, with, with the Facebook essay, and I just wrote another one, I think it's published this week in the New York Review, which is in some ways about uh, the phones um, as well. All that, all that stuff, it's not just grumpy no old novelists complaining about young people's social media, though I know there is a lot of that going on. The, the question is more a genuine question from one person to another, which is, is it making you happy? I'm not interested in what it's doing to your brain. Or what, I don't care about any of that stuff. And I, I'm not a neuroscientist. And I, I think most of the people who worry about it don't know what they're talking about either. But we can talk about happiness. And as far as I can see, in my case, certainly, and I'm talking about my own case, but in my friends, in my younger friends, mm. there is a lot of unhappiness being caused by the constant attachment to these devices. So that's my only question. Not that the technology is bad. Technology in itself is never bad, but is our usage of it, the way we're using it, genuinely making us happy? Because if it isn't, then you need to consider it in some way. Reconsider. It's not a crime to reconsider. It doesn't make you a Luddite or you know, a terrible fool. It just means this relationship is making me unhappy. And that's my feeling about it. I'm always about your own <laughs> relationship with the technology. And mine was poor. That's why I gave up Facebook. OK, one more. Um... There's Wherever a lady the in the front. Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, I have one. Okay. I, I thought... She, she in fact sat but, exactly this. But side. there was another college too, no? Was she here under the... She had a supporter, no? Yes. But, sorry, go on. Yeah. you show it are there people you show it to are there people um, you trust to read it before it becomes public I do but they don't support me in the way I think you're implying <laughs> 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 that's not my experience of of writing and it really never was like when we were in college um, English professors in England are not support is not high on their agenda <laughs> so I I'm not if I give it to someone and, and they just say it's good, those people are winnowed out quite quickly from the circle of shame that I need to have around my writing. So no, I, I, it's not supportive in that way, but it, in my view it is long-term supportive because what people are trying to say to you when they criticize your work is you can be ashamed in front of me, but do you want to be ashamed in front of X amount of people? They're saving you. And I, I don't understand why students particularly don't understand that. They get so angry when you edit them or criticize them, but it's like, do you want to be ashamed in this room or do you want to be ashamed in front of 100,000 people? I, don't, I just don't understand the logic of, mm. of not being criticized. Mm. To me, it's always, it's, I'm so grateful that I didn't show that 100 pages that cut out of white teeth, for example. I'm so glad you don't have to read that. That's, that's a gift. Mm. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh. Well, thank you, Zadie. And, yeah.